Good evening. Thank you for coming tonight to uh, the um, faculty fellowship lecture for Dr. Ryan Schellenberg. Um, a year ago, he was, I would like to say off, but it, th that's not actually what fellowships are. He was away from the classroom so that he could work on what is a book that he's doing on Paul and mass and, and incarceration, prison. Paul in prisons. And what you are about to experience is a part of that scholarship. Um, I asked him, I'm not going to read what you can read. I, I'm, I'm a little worried if you can't read it. <laughs> so I'm going to assume you can all read what's on the program. But I asked him, I said, what would you want me to tell people about yourself? Something that's personal but not too personal? Something that won't make people go, la, 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 la. <laughs> and what he said was that he blames his wife, Susan. I'm glad this is being live streamed so she can hear this. For his interest in mass incarceration, his wife, um, his partner in life, it was a chaplain in prisons and, uh, and with all the passion that that in, that ensues when you see injustices in our systems made him start thinking about what the Christian faith from its inception had to say about incarceration. And of course, duh, Paul was in prison. So that led him to the scholarship that you are about to receive today. Please receive Dr. Ryan Schellenberg as he presents Reading Philippians in the Age of Mass Incarceration. Thank you, Dr. Bridgman, and thank you all for being here. I know some of you have already had a long day of being lectured at. Uh, some of you have been lectured at by me already at least once today. Um, and others of you just have beautiful spring weather outside that you might prefer to be enjoying. So thank you for being here with us this evening. If instead of rulers and generals, one is interested in the lives of ordinary people, in history from below, as it is often called, the work of the historian is like trying to put together a jigsaw puzzle when most of the pieces are lost. What we have from the past are ruins, fragments, scraps. Most of our best sources survived accidentally, either because they were too trivial to be repurposed, like the stones of ancient cities, or too unimportant to be destroyed in fits of fundamentalist zeal, like lots of images and texts from the ancient world. So what we have are scraps, the accidental residue of the past. But sit with one of these scraps for a while, and one begins to hear a human voice, a snippet of an ancient conversation as though floating on the wind. Take what we have here, the verso of Papyrus Petri 336a, as it is inventoried, a scrap of an ancient prison letter from the 3rd century BCE found near the modern Egyptian city of Fayum in the ancient Greek administrative region of Arsinoe. To Nicanor, the manager, I have written to you many times, for I have been suffering in prison 10 months now. Wasting away of hunger, even though I was locked up unjustly, I ask you, begging, that you do not abandon me to perish of hunger in prison. But write to the treasurer about these things, or send me to him, so that I might be saved. The word I've translated manager here refers to a local financial official. The treasurer referred to at the bottom is a higher level regional official. And the references here to government revenue officials suggest that this man was imprisoned for financial obligations, likely unpaid taxes or tolls. Perhaps he was a small-time businessman or a merchant who was down on his luck, someone working in the gray market, as we call it, getting paid in cash. Whatever the circumstances, he's obviously now desperate, 
And he appeals to the local official to send his case on up to the higher level where it might be adjudicated. He's asking, as we see at the bottom, that he might be saved. Uh, my Greek students will already see the word soteria here, which in the New Testament almost always refers to salvation in some theological sense. But it's not, in fact, a theological word. It just means deliverance. And when Paul in Philippians 1.19 talks about his situation working out for his salvation, he's not talking about his eschatological fate. He's talking about getting out of jail. There, too, Paul is imagining deliverance. The language of wasting away that we see here is very common in ancient prison petitions. Um, and so is talk of hunger. In general, in the ancient world, prison officials provided not enough food, if any at all. And the responsibility for making sure that prisoners were fed fell on friends and family, uh, other associates who might take care of prisoners, who otherwise would literally starve to death. In the ancient documents, prison and death often go hand in hand. In one text from the early 3rd century CE, a subordinate dutifully files the paperwork. One of the imprisoned tax collectors who had taken ill inside died today, he reports matter-of-factly. Apparently, this was just another day on the job, and he's just reporting what he's obliged to report. To survive prison, then, it was crucial to have a network of support, friends or family, others that one could call on to provide the basic necessities and, of course, to give emotional care and support as well. The writer of this document is lucky. Uh, he's imprisoned far from home, but at least he has one potential ally, a man named Xenon, the manager of a large estate with whom he seems to have had some business dealings. Phoenesis, the corn measurer, to Xenon, greeting. It's now three days since Dionysodorus saw me and ordered me to be taken to the prison. Will you kindly then send one of your people to me, along with the messenger who hands you this letter, because I have no friend in the city, and send me a cloak or some money, as much as you please, to serve until one of my folk sails down. With no social connections in the city of his own, prison would be particularly tough. Phoenesis has written to his family too, we may infer, but they're somewhere up the Nile, and it will take some time for the message that he's been imprisoned to make its way up the river, and then for someone from his family to sail back down with the supplies that he needs. So he appeals to Xenon, who it seems is local, or at least nearly so, hoping that he will give him clothes and or money to tide him over. We can imagine Phoenesis in prison awaiting a response, not knowing with confidence whether his message his letter got to Xenon, not knowing whether Xenon was disposed to respond to it, no status updates or text messages to facilitate knowledge of his fate. He simply waits, hoping for the messenger to return with the cloak to keep him warm and money to provide his food while he's locked up. Imprisoned not in Egypt, but probably somewhere in Asia Minor, the imprisoned Paul was lucky too. For the assembly of believers in Philippi had heard about his plight and sent to him one of their own, a man named Epaphroditus, who brought with him food or funds, some means of sustenance, to keep Paul alive while Paul was in prison. In his return letter, Paul is exuberant. I was overjoyed in the Lord, he writes, that now at last you renewed your concern for me. He uses language here, that evokes, the, language, the word for re renewed evokes the flowering of new blossoms in spring after a large, long, hard winter. It's a picturesque word that's hard to convey in a simple translation in English. His at last here, I don't think is a kind of criticism of the Philippians for taking so long. It rather reflects what it felt like on Paul's end. Enduring the deprivation of prison with no clear end in sight, not knowing when and if uh, his message to the Philippians that he was in prison, whether it would arrive and whether they would, in fact, pull together the resources to send someone to help. Now, he says, he has more than enough. I've received full payment, he writes, and I have plenty. My needs have been fulfilled now that I've received from Epaphroditus the things that you have sent. 
Although Paul insists that in the meantime he was able to make do, that he has learned, as he puts it, the secret of being content in all circumstances, still it's clear that he's deeply grateful for the Philippians' care and concern, what he calls their partnership, or koinonia, with him in the gospel, which is a word often used to refer to a business relationship. This means also that they care for him in his situation of despair distress. And to him, it's a profound relief that he's not been forgotten, not been left to waste away in prison, to use the language we see in so many prison petitions. Philippians is often referred to as a letter of joy, all the more remarkable because Paul wrote it in prison. Sometimes this is interpreted as though Paul's steadfast conviction made him somehow almost immune to suffering, uh, as though, you know, because he's an apostle, he doesn't really feel it. Uh, Far too often in the way we read these kinds of texts, we can make Paul into a hero rather than a human, or sometimes, depending on how you feel about Paul, a villain instead of a human. Uh, Either way, his expressions of joy in prison become either superhuman or maybe delusional. What does he mean by talking about being joyful in prison? Sit patiently with this letter for a while, and you may begin to hear a human voice. You may notice, for example, that most of the references to joy in this letter relate to his joyful gratitude for the Philippians' faithful friendship that they expressed most recently precisely in sending Epaphroditus. Right at the beginning of the letter, he writes, I thank my God at every mention of you always in all my prayers for all of you, somewhat redundant, as Paul is wont to be. Making my prayers with joy because of your partnership with me in the gospel from the first day until now. You have become my generous partners both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Don't let the theological sounding language here distract you from what I think is the concrete social fact to which Paul refers. That is, he is not alone. He's not alone in this venture. The Philippians have his back. And to Paul, that means an awful lot. You may notice, too, that when Paul says that he would just as well die, that he would prefer, in fact, to leave his suffering behind and be with Christ in glory if it were up to him, that it's the prospect of a joyful reunion with the Philippians that gives him the strength to go on. I know that I will stay and remain with all of you, he writes at the end of this passage so that you may revel in Christ Jesus because of me when I turn up at your door. You probably don't recognize that translation, and this is the most liberty I've taken with any of the translations of my own that I've shown you so far. Um, Although, as I tell my Greek students, the idea that a literal word-for-word translation is what best conveys the meaning of the Greek is a fallacy. (laughs) It's an illusion. The idea that word-for-word translation from one language to another is somehow and accurately conveys the sense, uh, doesn't reflect what language actually is. But I don't need to give you a lecture on that. (laughs) We have a habit of imagining Paul often as if he were stern and self-possessed, apostolic, as it were. But with the Philippians, he wears his heart on his sleeve. He almost gushes, one might say. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, he writes, in a time before that was a dead metaphor. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, my dear family, beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, in other words, those who will be a symbol and token of the fact that I did not run or labor in vain on that final day, stand firm in the Lord, and then again, beloved ones. If our expectations weren't shaped by the fact that this text is in our Bibles, we would perhaps conclude that Philippians is less a theological treatise than a thank you note mixed with a love letter. Prison is a very important part of the story of early Christianity and not only for Paul. The experience of prison and then the memory of that experience shaped early Christian identity in very profound ways, ways that still persist now. Listen, for example, to a comment by Daffy Ball Uh, who is imprisoned at Greaterford Prison in Pennsylvania, and whose story I know uh, because of Joshua Doubler's wonderful book, Down in the Chapel. 
People out on the street, they're not in prison, he writes, but mentally they are. A lot of guys in here, they've by, be, been saved by Jesus Christ, and they're free. Whatever you might want to make of this idea, the general sentiment is in fact quite common among, or has been quite common among prisoners. From the Puritan preacher John Bunyan to the Black Panther activist Huey P. Newton. In fact, it's just the sort of thing Tertullian might have said in the second century. Though the body is shut in, though the flesh is confined, all things are open to the spirit, he writes in a treatise addressed to the martyrs in North Africa. The leg does not feel the chain when the mind is in the heavens. This conviction that one's mind or spirit could be free even while one's body is in chains has had a very significant impact on how the self has been conceived in Western thought. The idea that selfhood is principally constituted by interiority. Sometimes this has had negative effects for the way we've seen bodies. Prison has also had a very lasting effect on the shape of Christian piety. It's not a coincidence that there is a strong similarity, a, a number of strong similarities between the prison and the monastery. The Christian ideal in each instance was the cultivation of a rich inner life in solitude and silence. As Tertullian puts it, the prison gives to the Christian what the wilderness did to the prophet. This is in the second century when the threat of imprisonment subsided, the devout found a new wilderness in the monastery. The tragic irony here is that the modern prison, perhaps the furthest thing anyone can imagine from a place of spiritual retreat, was born from just these seeds when, in the late 18th century, well-meaning Christians sought to impose monastic-like discipline on those who were convicted of crimes in the belief that solitude and reflection would lead sinners to penitence, hence our term penitentiary. Eastern State Penitentiary in Pennsylvania was one of the earliest and most famous of these early prisons, opened in 1829, and prisoners there were forced uh, to abide by a strict regimen of solitude and silence. We don't know the minds of the architects, but the story goes, at least, that the doors are so short because prisoners are supposed to have to duck to learn humility on their ways into their cells. But if Christian martyrs and monks had found in the disciplines of solitude and silence a pathway to God, it turned out that one couldn't force this experience on others. <laughs> Isolation from other humans for extended periods of time is immensely destructive. Charles Dickens got a tour of Eastern State Penitentiary in 1842, and he wrote, I hold this slow and daily tampering with the mysteries of the brain to be immeasurably worse than any torture of the body. The penitentiary as initially conceived then was quite obviously a failed experiment. It didn't produce reformed sinners, it produced broken people. Still, for a number of reasons, that didn't stop us from building more of them. Most significant here, probably, was the abolition of slavery in the South in the mid-19th century, shortly after the prisons were built in the North. These famous prisons were built in the Northeast. This, the abolition of slavery, left white Southerners looking for other ways to subdue black bodies. The prison, plus the widespread practice of convict leasing, helped ensure a return to the previous balance of power. Many states in the South had black codes, uh, laws that essentially criminalized being African American. Um, vagrancy was often a crime that could be punished with imprisonment. Uh, loitering was often a crime that could be punished with imprisonment. In some states, black men had to be able to demonstrate written proof of, em of employment, not to possess that was, uh, was a crime. Uh, and, so, and so many black, especially black men, ended up incarcerated, and states in the South figured out that they could lease these black laborers 
to the plantation owners who no longer had slaves to work their fields. Um, sometimes even juvenile convicts, as we see in this photo from 1903, were working in the fields. For about 150 years from the 1830s on, prison was a significant part of American life and it was an instrument of racial subjugation. But compared with today, its reach was relatively modest. In 1970, there were about 340,000 Americans behind bars. And then quite suddenly, like a cancer, it metastasized, infecting our corporate body in unprecedented and immensely destructive ways. This timeline shows the American prison population. This does not include jail, but only state and federal prison, which you can see was relatively stable for quite a long period and then dramatically exploded in the 1980s and 90s. It grew something like fivefold over a period of 25 years. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the causes of this right now. Um, I will, uh, if you put your email address on that registration sheet when you came in or do so afterwards. I'm going to send out an email with a list of resources on, it has more reading on a number of the topics I'm touching on today. Um, I'll just really briefly say the war on drugs has been a significant contributor to this. Mandatory minimum sentences have been a significant contributor to this. Uh, growing use of plea deals has been a significant contributor to this. At present, something like 95% of criminal charges do not go to trial but are resolved by plea deal, which means with, with the threat of very serious sentences hanging over the heads of people who find uh, agreeing to a plea deal the less frightening option, um, even sometimes in cases where they're not guilty of, of their offenses. Uh, and another factor is perhaps less obvious. Another factor is the, the decline of rural economies in the United States that's related to the industrialization of agriculture, which has meant that building prisons in rural places has often been seen as a job-boosting effort. And this is one of the reasons that prisons are now usually built in rural areas. Uh, if we compare the reality in the United States with the reality in the world as a whole, we see it's, it's obvious that the United States has the unfortunate distinction of incarcerating far more of its citizens than any other country in the world. Um, Russia and Rwanda are the closest. Brazil, which has its own concerns around incarceration, still incarcerates less than half as many people um, proportionally as does the United States. And the countries, the, the advanced liberal democracies that we like to compare ourselves with in Europe and elsewhere, incarcerate, we incarcerate five or six or seven times as many people as in those countries. Right now, the total number of people in jail or prison in the United States is something like 2.1 or 2.2 million, which is about the population of greater Columbus, so Columbus and all the suburbs around it. Um, which amounts to nearly one out of every hundred adult men in the United States. Uh, and it's really important to know that the burden of this is not equally distributed. This one in a hundred very general stat, or one out of 107, or whatever, the, I don't know a current precise stat, um, masks over all kinds of differences in how this affects different communities. Uh, some of you may have heard the statistic that the lifetime likelihood of a black man being incarcerated is one in three. Now there's been some question, this stat is now a number of years old, and there's been st some question about whether it exaggerates the picture. Uh, I'm not going to st stand behind it. If it's one in four, I'm <laughs> it does not, to me, uh, become a less shocking statistic. Black men are about six to eight times more likely to be, to be in prison than whites. And here I think it's also important to know that the impact of this is not only on those individuals who are incarcerated. Prison, I think, is like a poison that spreads throughout our social body. Consider what it does to a neighborhood when more young men head off to prison each year than head off to college. And then, at least as significant, more slightly older young men come back from prison every year than return home with a degree. 
Consider the 2.7 million children in the U.S. who currently have a parent in jail or prison and who, not surprisingly, are more likely than their peers to end up incarcerated themselves. Or consider the mostly right, white rural communities, which is where most prisons have been built in the last 40 years, where one of the only secure jobs in town is as a correctional officer, overseeing the dehumanization of other people, and then inevitably bringing that back home. I could give a very different talk than I'm going to give today about why and how people of faith should confront mass incarceration, what kind of political uh, solutions we might envision, how the stories of the early church might inspire in the, us in this way, or even how the story of John Wesley might inspire us in this way. Um, these things are all really important, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, there is a danger, I think, that in talking mostly about those in prison and how we might help them, we actually end up replicating the logic that created the modern prison in the first place. We can too easily treat those in prison as if they're the passive recipients of our charity and we're the ones who have something to offer. This is just like prison itself, which systematically strips people of their agency and self-determination. It's sobering, I think, to recall that the first major attempt at prison reform in the United States was the building of the prisons themselves. Prison reform is dangerous, as well as necessary. So in the time we have left, I want to approach this a little bit differently by listening to the voices of those inside prison, ancient and modern, even if we might wince on occasion at some of the things we hear. Uh, first of all, let's return to Paul, who I will say sometimes makes me wince. <laughs> so, before we, uh, before we talk about Paul as a prisoner, I think we do need to address a preliminary question that may seem merely biographical initially, if, merely bi if, bi if the biographical is something mere, uh, but turns out, I think, to have significant consequences for how we understand his letter to the Philippians. Why was Paul in prison in the first place? He was not in prison for being a Christian, because in the mid-50s, when he was incarcerated, no one knew what a Christian was. None of the Roman magistrates would have had any clue what a Christian was, and it certainly wasn't illegal to be one. So whatever landed Paul in prison, it was not being a Christian. Now, in the second century, it starts to become problematic at times to be a Christian, but not in the first century, at least not in the 50s. More, also significantly, Paul was not in prison once or twice, but repeatedly. In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul writes, I've suffered far more travails, far more imprisonments. This is far more than those rival apostles of his in Corinth who he wants to have bragging rights over. Countless more floggings and many brushes with death. From the Jews, I received 39 lashes five times, three times I've been beaten with rods. So what it was it exactly that got Paul into trouble, not just once, but repeatedly? We really don't know for sure, and his letters don't tell us, but I'm going to give you the most plausible explanation that I can, uh, looking at the evidence. You can tell me what you think. Particularly suggestive, I think, is a story that Josephus tells. He's a first century Jewish historian. He tells a story about a Jew in Rome who made a living for himself as a specialist in the law of Moses. Now, he was not a Jew teaching other Jews about the law of Moses. He was a Jew teaching Romans about the law of Moses, some of whom seem to be fascinated with Jewish lore. Ancient Eastern lore, in particular, had some kind of appeal among Romans, maybe in a similar kind of way that Eastern religion has sometimes had an appeal in the United States. Um, this Jewish teacher has one adherent whose name is Fulvia. She's an elite woman with a powerful husband. And she eventually starts taking up Jewish practices, Sabbath, food laws, those sorts of things. Other writers from this time, too, sometimes complain about how Roman women are especially attracted to foreign cults, what they thought of as Jewish superstition. This doesn't really seem to raise any problems until this Jewish teacher starts raising funds for the temple in Jerusalem and convinces Fulvia to give a good-sized sum. This suddenly gets her husband's attention, 
<laughs> right. And because he's a friend of the emperor, it gets Emperor Tiberius' attention too. They decide that these Jewish teachers are con men and frauds intent on lining their own pockets, and they expel all Jewish teachers from Rome. I think we should keep this story in mind as we think about Paul. There is some evidence in his letters that Paul was particularly persuasive among women and slaves, sometimes apart from the male heads of the households in which these women and slaves belonged. In Romans, he greets, for example, the church in the house of Aristobulus, as though Aristobulus's slaves and maybe women in his household are a gathered community of believers, but Aristobulus himself is not. How would the heads of these households have felt about the devotion of their slaves and perhaps even their wives to a foreign god? And then, to this Paul, and then how would they felt, have felt about this Paul character who called himself an apostle, an emissary of this strange deity? These are not, we must remember, egalitarian households. Uh, women are not free to choose their own whatever religious expressions and convictions accord with their inner selves. Uh, the male head of these households expects loyalty and allegiance, and this is expressed in part by shared worship of the traditional gods. The first century Greek writer Plutarch writes a pamphlet of advice to a bride and a groom, and in it he says, a married woman should therefore worship and recognize the gods whom her husband holds dear, and these alone. The door must be closed to strange cults and foreign superstitions, no god takes pleasure in a cult performed furtively and in secret by a woman. Uh, you can see any number of prejudices being expressed in this text. I'm looking at you, Euodia and Suntike, Phoebe, Tryphena, and Tryphosa. And then, if that's not bad enough, Paul starts taking up a collection to bring back to Jerusalem. At least, that's what he says it's for. It's not at all difficult, then, to imagine someone complaining about this Paul, who's getting his slaves all worked up about a foreign god, and trying to convince his wife to give money. <laughs> if this irritated man, ha man has the right friends, Paul lands up in prison, beaten, told to leave town. Again, this is a hypothetical scenario. I don't have evidence that proves it but it seems to me the most plausible reading based on what we know about Paul and his context. Perhaps there are hints of this sort of scenario in 1 Thessalonians. It looks like Paul was driven out of town, which is why he writes a letter to the Thessalonians, sent, sends Timothy to deliver it rather than going himself. As for us, brothers and sisters, he writes, when for a short time we were made orphans by being separated from you, in other words, he didn't leave town because he wanted to, in person, not in heart, we longed with great eagerness to see you face to face. We wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, wanted to, wanted to again and again, but Satan blocked our way. Again, we don't know for sure, but it seems likely to me that here Satan is working in the person of the local magistrate who has told Paul he can't come back. Uh, and this hadn't been the first time that he got kicked down the road from one town to another. He writes, though we had sh already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, in other words, he had had a similar experience there, got booted the few miles down the road from Philippi to Thessalonica. And then, because, as he writes here, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition, he gets booted down the road again. And then we have what seems to me is initially a strange non sequitur. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery. What connection does that have to what goes before? Why would Paul be explaining at this point in his letter that his appeal doesn't spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery unless this comes to his mind when he thinks about the kind of opposition he faced and the kind of accusations he faced, that in fact his appeal did spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, and this was why he got himself into trouble. One thing I think is important for us to notice here is that this trouble is not, if I could put it this way, glamorous trouble. That is, Paul is not getting a show trial before the local governor 
his situation is not on televised TV. He's rather, or national TV, he's rather being treated as a low level public nuisance. More a matter of civic hygiene than of Roman law. Here we should notice too that the fact that Paul was imprisoned and beaten tells us something significant about his social status. For just as in our world, some social groups were far more likely to land up in prison than others. Look, for example, at Cicero, the Roman orator, complaining about what he deemed unjust incarceration of one of his clients. If Apollonius, the man he's defending, were ever so much at fault, he writes, still an honorable man of a most honorable city ought not to have been so severely punished without a trial, lying in prison in darkness, in dirt, in filth. What bothers Cicero is not that a man might be severely punished without a trial. This happened all the time. What bothered Cicero is that a man of dignity would be treated this way. Uh, the, in fact, the summary imprisonment and beating of lower class folk seems to have been more or less routine. It built it on the assumption, which continues to our day, that some bodies possess dignity and others don't. That some bodies can be beaten and caged with impunity, and others cannot. Contrast Cicero's dismay about how Apollonius is treated with what an, unfortunately, what, what an unfortunate slave says to himself in a Roman play by Plautus. He's going to be late, and he knows he's going to be in trouble for being late. It'll be bam pow on my back, but I don't care, he says. He'll have me flogged, he'll have me put in leg irons. Nothing new now that he can do to me that I'm not already an expert in. Is this bravado? Is it resignation? Is it both? Do those who are habitually treated this way eventually learn to take pride in their tough skin, even if they know it should never have been this way in the first place? As in the American story, some bodies are protected by law and custom, and others are not. And in the Roman world, how low-class freed people were treated. Low-class free people were treated was not much better than slaves, particularly not when they were not local, when they were itinerant. Paul's back may not have looked so different from a slave named Gordon that we're looking at here. Far more imprisonments, countless floggings, 40 lashes minus one, beaten with rods. The body of this Paul apparently did not merit the sort of deference that was given to respectable folks. He was rather treated like an itinerant laborer, a traveling charlatan, a public nuisance, beaten, locked up, kicked down along, to, along the road to the next town. His body was, as Jennifer Glancy puts it in a really excellent article on Paul's beatings. His body was a whippable one. And I think we need to keep this in mind when reading a text like Philippians 3, verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven, Paul writes, and it's from there that we're expecting a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. The body of our humiliation, Paul writes, his own body scarred, bound, ill-clothed, hungry. Notice the reference at the end of this passage to Christ's power, to which everything else, everything in heaven and on earth and under the earth, as Paul puts it back in chapter 2, must bend the knee in subjection. In the face of his bodily degradation, Paul envisions a rearrangement of power relations that is also an alternate economy of the body, with Christ as glorious sovereign, all things subject to him, and Paul transformed into a body that is likewise glorious, which is also to say inviolable, no longer subject to demeaning treatment at the hands of his captors, who now find themselves bending the knee to Christ. While Paul, Christ's devoted slave apostle, looks on in triumph. This may look like escapism, the leg that doesn't mind the chain when the mind is in the heavens. It may look like Paul is indulging in eschatological fantasy instead of confronting the reality of the world around him. 
religion here is perhaps serving as the opiate of the people. But look at what fruit it yields. For along with his partnership with the Philippians, it is this eschatological conviction that helped him get by, that gave him the strength of spirit and will to talk about speaking boldly on the gospel's behalf, whatever the consequences, to speak, too, of joy and thanksgiving and peace, even while in prison. Don't worry about anything, Paul tells the Philippians, surely, like most prisoners, preaching first of all to himself. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul manages, it would appear, even in the midst of prison, to cultivate gratitude and joy and peace, even while he also yearns impatiently for his deliverance or his death, whichever comes first. And Paul is not the only one. I'm going to give you just one example in closing. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about a woman named Candace, who's currently serving a life sentence at Women's Huron Valley Correctional Facility in Michigan. And her story, parts of her diary actually, come to me from Laura Bex Lempert's excellent book, Women Doing Life. Candace's sense of herself and her experience of prison is very deeply shaped by what she calls her personal relationship with Jesus. Some expressions of this piety are of the sort that we, that are often dismissed as being naive or even perhaps superstitious. Candace sees God's hand constantly at work in the ordinary affairs of her daily life. When the COs deny her what seem to be reasonable requests, she's convinced that God wants to teach her something through the trial. When she unexpectedly gets a piece of pizza instead of the normal prison fare, she says that God has blessed her with it. One might be tempted to smirk at this, perhaps, were it not for the truly remarkable fruit that her spirituality bears. For in prison, Candace is filled not with resentment or bitterness or anger or fear or dejection, although certainly she has moments of all of these. On the whole, though, Candace's diary is filled with expressions of her resilience, compassion for those who are around her, and also, strikingly, gratitude. She is grateful for the late-night thunderstorm that she interprets as a beautiful gift just to her from God. She's grateful when she's able to be reconciled with her justifiably moody bunkie, a woman for whom she regularly prays. She's even grateful in an odd way for her imprisonment, or rather, what she says she's learned from it, saying, like Joseph, you intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. Candace finds, against all odds, the intimate benevolence of God's providence expressed in what would otherwise seem the crazy-making arbitrariness of life in prison. For those of us who are convinced that prison is evil, a blight on our society that would best be abolished, this sort of talk can be disconcerting. A story like Candace's doesn't help us articulate the cruel destructiveness of prison or advocate for its end. It can feel like it takes us off message. It might also be tempting to write it off as false consciousness or self-delusion, spiritualizing escapism, as though we know better than Candace does what her imprisonment means. But perhaps if we sit with her story a while, we may begin to hear a human voice, and one that poses a helpful challenge to some of our most basic assumptions. We live in a time where the basic logic of liberal democracy, the social contract that has served as the ideological glue for the nations of the West, is under attack. And it is under attack, I think, chiefly because it has been unable to deliver what it has promised. We have been promised, or seem to think we have been promised, both freedom and security, which in practice has meant freedom for some, maximum security for others. Likewise, the evangelists of the free market economy have promised us prosperity, unending prosperity. And even more, they've told us that our lives depend on it. That to live without purchasing power is to live in a state of subhumanity, unable to realize our full human potential. And yet, as we're increasingly becoming aware, we live on a finite planet. 
We cannot go on expecting perpetual economic growth. We cannot go on expressing ourselves, as the idiom goes, by means of what we purchase and consume. We cannot go on thinking that the point of being a self is to express oneself, as though we were most truly ourselves, most true to ourselves, when we live free of constraint. This conception of the self is really the perfect correlate to the neoliberal logic that is strangling life on our planet. And here I think we might learn from those who have had to reckon more immediately with the failure of these illusory promises. Every time I enter a prison, I meet men, Christian and otherwise, who humble me by their openness and their grace, which they preserve against all odds. Don't get me wrong, prison is evil and degrading, and I believe we should work to end it. But what I would urge, too, is that voices from inside, voices like those of Candace, can help us learn a spirituality of contingency and a spirituality of contentment, even while we struggle, I hope, against the forces that lock them away. And perhaps Paul can help us with this, too, if we can strip away the patina of pious idealization that hides from us the real and profound contingency of his life, his humanness, and the real distress that he too faced while in prison, hoping that he might be saved, convinced that one day he would be exalted, and grateful in the meantime for the Philippians' faithful friendship. Thank you. All right, I am happy to take your questions. Um, Kathy is walking around with a mic, so if you could please make sure you get, or and so is Dr. Bridgman, so if you can please make sure you get a mic as you speak. Hi, uh, James Lance from yeah. FTSO. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if we're supposed to introduce or not. Um, so this may go in the direction you didn't want to go, so if it does, let me know. But I noticed that, uh, so as opposed to Paul's other letters, in Galatians where he's angry, in Thessalonians where he's keeping up with them a bit, Corinthians he's agitated, Romans he doesn't really know them, Philippians is the one that he actually truly loves. And he mm -hmm. says that this is the church that means to be a church, and this is what it means to follow God. I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to that and into today, what it means that the one church that Paul holds up is the church that actually reaches out and listens to those in prison, and what it means to be the church today that actually listens. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know that I have a lot more to say other than to affirm, uh, to affirm that comment. Um, I, one of the other things that I uh, have worked on digging up are texts that show churches from the second and third and fourth and fifth century, where care for those who are imprisoned is fundamental to what it means to be part of, to, fundamental to how Christian charity is conceived. Um, I earlier said some things that make that word charity a little bit dangerous, perhaps. Here I think it's interesting to notice that even in the fifth century, John Chrysostom, writing a sermon about visiting prisoners, he knows and he says it, that when you go to visit those in prison, you're going to benefit as much as they are. Uh, and that's, a, that's recognition that even the earliest Christians, um, that's something even the earliest Christians were aware of. Yeah. left us stunned, Ryan. <laughs> um, so my, my question is around kind of this, uh, the, the description of Paul and how um, obnoxious he was landing him in prison <laughs> uh -huh. um, makes me wonder about the role of civil disobedience and activism um, in our time in an age of mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of King and Letter from a Birmingham yeah. Jail, and kind of, in a sense, um, having a platform from prison mm 
to say something that that's more powerful. Right. And and I just wonder about that. Um, there's something strategic, I think, that you're almost saying about Paul landing himself in pr prison. It gives him a different kind of voice, a different kind of audience, and and how that intersects with compassion for those who are in prison, not because of their own volition or choices that they've necessarily made. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, and I think there's some, one of the things that I am, in my own work, one of the things that I've been a little bit reluctant to do is, is work too much with the texts from political prisoners because they feel safe and canonical in the same way that Philippians usually feel safe and canonical if that makes sense. We already know they're the good guys. Um, now that's not, I have utmost respect for the letter from Birmingham jail and for Bonhoeffer's letters and papers from prison and for any number of other, of these other texts that have been inspiring and meaningful. But I also have been pondering how to hear the voices of those that are not so easily held up as moral exemplars and how they too uh, can participate in their own can participate in their own redemption rather than it being something that those of us who think that we are the light and have the light offer to them um, so how to how to yes celebrate the ways in which in which particular prisoners particular usually prisoners of conscience have something unique and important to say to us and yet also not let that crowd out the voices of others. Thank you. Oh, there are, okay. Thank you so much, Ryan. You, you got me thinking about what is that, um, the aspect of human nature, you know, if we take the experience of Paul being in adversity and um, as the recipient of injustice or unjust treatment, that that generates a different kind of spirituality or a deeper theology that is very radical, but mm -hmm. it's, been, uh, it's been used to maintain people in oppression. Yeah. Like it's been turned against right. itself. And yet what, what you showed us is that it's very uh, liberating mm -hmm. and it's very empowering for the people who are experiencing that and can be freed, although they are in chains. Yeah. But uh, I don't know if that's for a biblical scholar or for <laughs> a pastoral theologian, that question. But that was so rich, you know, to just begin to think in these more um, juxtapositional terms. Um, so I don't know if it's a question, but I wanted you to know that this is really rich thinking on multidimensional aspects of our work. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm, I mean, I'm just convinced that words and theological ideas don't mean the same thing when they move from one context to another. So it is life-giving for Paul and his experience of imprisonment just means something different when it's coming from the mouth of those who are putting people in prison. The same words, the same theological ideas don't have the same significance and import. Um, and I think that's important to be attentive to. Yes. So during your lecture this evening, you spoke about Paul having a whippable body. And in our Greek classes, we've been going through Philippians, we've talked about Paul using language in a way that sort of shifts his shameful position into one of honor. Mm -hmm. I was wondering in your research of modern prisoners, if you've seen some means of their contextualizing their imprisonment to redeem their own sense of dignity. Yeah. While they, wh whether it's through their faith in Christ or their partnerships with friends who are on the outside. Constantly, all the time. And, and all kinds of different ways. I mean, the first quip that comes to mind is a prisoner who says in an interview, uh, they think I'm going to be, be a badass, so I'm going to show them how big a badass I can be. Right? Redefining the identity of being a rebel. You know, when you try to crush a person, um, uh, when you try to crush a person, there's always something left, right? There's always some residue of human will that expresses itself in some other way. Uh, Gresham Sykes wrote about this like 40 years ago in his book, The Society of Captives, um, where he talks about the defects of total power. When you have total power, you can't actually command obedience um, because prisoners 
will inevitably respond to total power by finding, a, finding ways around it, finding ways to express some part of them of their, uh, their continuing will and their continuing humanity in the ways that are exactly what their captors don't want them to do. Um, so sometimes it, expre it expresses itself in all kinds of different ways, uh, sometimes this, but also sometimes, like as in the example of Candace, um, Candace takes a kind of pride in her Christian identity. Um, others take a kind of pride in their identity as parents, and they devote themselves, even from prison, to being the best parents they possibly can be. Um, there's all manner of ways in which those who are incarcerated can express that. Uh, I had one question about, when, when uh, Jesus talks about uh, whatever you've done, the least of these, you've, mm -hmm. you, in your research and from a, a, a linguistic standpoint, do you perceive that as the, that you're experiencing being with Christ, or is it that it's more of a feather in your cap that will be remembered when you come to the gates kind of thing? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, well, clearly in Matthew 25, the theme of, of judgment is at the forefront. So clearly there's something about how your actions will affect judgment. But the way, maybe the, the best thing I can say is that when, when the first Christians picked up on those words, um, they really interpreted them quite literally as though Christ was going around disguised in the presence of the prisoner. Um, and there are, there are many, many sermons from, again, the 3rd and 4th and 5th century where Matthew 25 is just casually alluded to as though everybody knows that when you see the poor and when you see the prisoner and when you see the orphan, that's Jesus there. John? Uh, thanks for a very good lecture. Um, this is going to be uh, uh, perhaps a needling question, but I'd be curious to know uh, how you visualize Paul a little bit more, uh, given what we know about levels of literacy, for example, mm -hmm. at, that, at that time, and then the portrayal of Paul as a public nuisance in prison, uh, can you say more about that picture? Uh huh. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not. So, the background of the question is that literacy is is very restricted in the ancient world, and that it has often been assumed that Paul's literacy attests to a fairly elevated social status. But I think this actually complicates the question, or oversimplifies the questions around literacy a little bit. Because some of the other people in the ancient world who would not have, Plutarch wouldn't have liked that they had to write, um, but who were literate, were slaves or professional scribes. That is, I think that there is, if we look away from the elite pedagogy, and instead we look to the we look to uh, the settings in which people wrote for humbler reasons and in humbler ways. That we might find their closer analog to a figure like Paul, um, who uh, who somehow at the same time can write passages of of, I think, really exquisite beauty and then can't quite get his sentences to be complete sentences in other places. <laughs> and these two things sit right side by side, which I still feel like I'm wrestling with how to make sense of. Yeah. But I'd like to, I'd be interested to hear more from you on that, too, at some point. <laughs> So when you were talking about the different types of bodies, Paul having a whippable body, um, my question uh, is in terms of like embodied spiritual expression and how you would understand, uh, for example, affective religious expression. For example, we know Paul engaged in ecstatic religious expression mm -hmm. and how that relates to one's social perception and the way that one's embodiment 
is understood socially. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, well, I, I certainly think that it is both true and under-acknowledged among readers of Paul, the extent to which ecstatic religious experience is formational. Um, that is, that his speaking in tongues, he says he spoke in tongues more than anyone else. This is experience Holy Spirit. Um, his visionary experiences that he lays claim, lays claim to, and the what he calls wonders and mighty works, which seem to be, he talks about this in 2 Corinthians 12, almost in passing, but it seems to be that he experiences God power flowing through him in some kinds of manifestations. And, um, and I think this quite profoundly shapes the way he experiences his own body as a potential conduit of spiritual power, which is part of why this language of dying with Christ and then rising with Christ makes so much sense to him. Because he knows from the whip that hits his back, he knows hints of what that mortality feels like. But he also knows from those moments of ecstasy where he is, where he is speaking out of his own mouth words that are words of the spirit, where he gets little tastes of that glory and exaltation that he writes about. He knows that too, and he knows in his body both of those kinds of experiences. And so he writes those onto the narrative of Christ, the dying with Christ, the being raised again with Christ, and imagines a time where the only part of that story that's left is the life part, the being raised with Christ part, and that dying part, the, whip, the, you know, the whipping of his back, is left behind. Thank you, Ryan, for an excellent um, lecture. I am struck by, I want to go back to something you said, the very first part of the lecture about salvation. Mm. Um, and particularly, I want you to reflect on how prison ministry has focused on the salvation of the soul based on the Pauline text. Mm -hmm. um, and what it might mean in this age of mass incarceration for us to think about salvation as deliverance in the way that you talked about it. So you kind of said that in passing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't really in passing, but, but I would like you to reflect just a little bit on the implications of the misuse of the word salvation mm -hmm. as it relates to these Pauline texts coming from prison. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I th um, it certainly is true that I mentioned, I mentioned John Wesley earlier, um, that when John Wesley went to prison, the prince, he was concerned with the salvation of souls uh, as he conceived it. He was also concerned with horrible prison conditions and worked hard to try to ameliorate them. And those two things went hand in hand for him. Um, and I think... Uh, I don't think there's any path forward for the church confronting mass incarceration that doesn't involve significant political advocacy so that salvation can't just mean we make a whole bunch of contented and docile prisoners who say they believe in Jesus. Um, salvation has to involve something more than that. And so just a shout out to the fact that there's a bill before the Congress that would restore Pell Grants for those who are incarcerated that you should advocate on behalf of if you can, um, as just one instance of where we might do that. At the same time, um, I think it can be tempting, as I hinted at in the lecture, it can be tempting to write off as a distraction from that political work the stories of transformation that those in prison themselves uh, articulate. And if we're going to take incarcerated men and women, not just as the objects of our action, but as our partners in it. We want to listen to, to the ways that they talk about their experience of salvation in Jesus, in ways that sometimes might not mesh very well with our own theology. Uh, and I think it's important that we listen. Let's thank Ryan again for his lecture.
And if you do want resources, make sure your email's on that list by the door. Have a good night. <laughs>